Now I'll hand the screen over to Dr. Swashini Ratnatunga. Uh, before that, I'll do a brief introduction. Dr. Ratnatunga is a lecturer in psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Colombo, and she is a board certified consultant psychiatrist at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. She's also an honorary psychiatrist for the Sri Lanka Air Force. Dr. Ratnatunga graduated from the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Colombo and pursued her postgraduate training in psychiatry at the postgraduate unit of the University of Colombo Institute of Medicine. She has also obtained a doctorate in medicine in adult psychiatry from the University of Colombo. Once she was done with this, she completed her overseas training at the Oxford Health NHS Trust and the Oxford University Hospitals in the UK, where she worked in liaison psychiatry services and early intervention in psychosis services. She was admitted to the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK and is a member of the Royal College Adult Psychiatry Faculty. Um, over to you, so Ashley now. I think we can start. Just gonna mute myself. Thank you, Nirusha, um, for that lovely introduction. Thank you to the OGA for inviting me to talk on this very important topic. And um, good evening, everybody. I'm sharing my screen. So can you see a slide uh, with my name on it saying investing in mental health? Yes, yes, we can. OK, um, just to start off with, the concept of mental health has actually changed over the past 50 to 60 years, over the past decades, um, mainly as uh, our understanding of mental illnesses have now evolved over the past few years as a result, result of um, advances in science. And now as psychiatrists or mental health professionals, we no longer accept that the absence of mental illness is merely good mental health. The WHO uh, refined their uh, definition of mental health. And in their definition, the, they added these components, subjective well-being, perceived self-efficacy, the ability to realize one's intellectual and emotional potential, um, the ability to cope with normal stresses of life and to work productively and fruitfully. So if you have good mental health, then you should be able to, uh, in a way, tick all these boxes. Uh, as a psychiatrist, uh, for me too, uh, good mental health is not just to see my patients with a mental disorder getting better. It's actually a bit more than that. I would like to see them uh, reach their fullest potential. I would like them to be happy in life, to be content, to have uh, satisfactory interpersonal relationships, to have loving, caring relationships, to engage in leisure activities, to engage in hobbies, um, to engage in society and to contribute towards society. So for a psychiatrist, um, good mental health is what this, what, what this slide uh, tells you. Okay, when we uh, talk about mental illness or mental health, um, mental illness is uh, brought about or mental, good mental health is brought about by a combination of many factors. Simply put, we call them positive factors and negative factors. So um, negative factors are what we also call risk factors or negative uh, influences, uh, which are either biological, psychological, or social, that have an impact on the brain. So um, lots and lots of research have now confirmed that genetics play a key role in the development of mental illnesses. So if you have a family history of mental illness, the chances of you um, going on to develop a mental illness is quite high. Childhood adversity, such as sexual trauma, uh, physical trauma, all this can have an effect on the developing brain. Substance use, we are actually seeing uh, almost an epidemic of substance misuse in Sri Lanka 
these days and substance mis uh, misuse can alter the chemistry of your brain. Um, debilitating or chronic physical illnesses, um, illnesses like hypothyroidism or thyroid disease, uh, all of this can have an effect on mental health. And of course, social factors such as unemployment, domestic violence, um, so marginalization, belonging to minority groups, all this can um, come together and play a negative role and bring about mental illness uh, by its interaction on the brain. Then we talk about protective factors or positive factors, factors that have a positive effect on the brain factors that can actually protect you from certain mental illnesses and uh, factors that can actually dampen the effect of negative um, influences. Again, we are now recognizing certain genes, genes of resilience, genes that attribute you to have a positive cognitive style uh, to um, uh, reduce the impact of uh, certain negative factors. Higher educational attainment, um, uh, uh, um, belonging to uh, a higher social class can also are also considered positive uh, and protective factors. Good interpersonal relationships have time and time again shown um, to have a, an extremely positive effect um, on the brain and on the mind. Um, and of course, timely interventions, timely uh, psychiatric interventions, medication can also protect the brain from uh, mental illness. So in summary, good mental health or even mental illness is basically brought about by these factors interacting together. Okay, so what the pandemic actually did to our brains was this, it, it added an extra negative factor, which is the social factor, a social factor to this uh, equilibrium. So, sorry. Um, uh, I think Nirusha uh, summarized most of this. So the pandemic caused um, a lot of fear in us, the fear that we may contract the disease, fear that our loved ones might contract the disease, fear that we might be shipped off to a quarantine facility. We also lost structure to our day. We were asked to work from home, um, curfews were brought about. So all this uh, 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 made us lose structure. Uh, in our days. Uh, we were also, our physical activity was restricted. Some of us lost, some of us had pay cuts, some people lost their jobs. Um, and also we had to face added chores like uh, homeschooling our kids. Um, uh, when less help was available at home, we had to um, attend to those. And also we saw an increase in substance misuse. So the pandemic actually added that extra negative social factor um, to, uh, to uh, 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 as an added an extra negative factor. Okay, so scientists were interested in this and uh, lots of research papers started coming out over the past few months and actually started coming out last year actually. Because uh, in the ERs and in hospitals, we started seeing a lot of uh, depression and anxiety. And I have summarized some, so these are some of the, um, uh, these are some good articles which you all also can probably go through in your free time. And what these meta-analysis and systematic reviews finally told us is, so this, this evidence is summarized for today. So it is uh, updated evidence for the 22nd of May, 2021, that there have been a significant uh, increase in uh, levels of depression and anxiety all over the world. So lots of countries have now reported that the uh, uh, rates of depression have increased. Um, dip, uh, different meta-analysis uh, meta show different rates, but depression has increased. It, the lowest uh, recorded was about 15% in the general population and the highest in one meta-analysis was 31% and anxiety was 15% and um, had gone up to sometimes in certain uh, um, databases to 31%. So the usual uh, prevalence, worldwide prevalence of depression is about 10% and that is during the non-COVID times, 
But as you can see, during the COVID times, there has been a significant increase in the levels of depression all over the world. We are also seeing other psychiatric sequelae like insomnia and PTSD. And now new research is coming up that these uh, disorders are also uh, playing a prominent role. Um, of all the, of, well, the healthcare workers are considered more vulnerable and there have been lots of, uh, again, papers coming out that doctors and other mental health, uh, sorry, other professionals, uh, healthcare professionals are affected and the depression and anxiety levels in this um, uh, subgroup is very high. Uh, good news is that if you do develop COVID, the chances of you having an acute illness acute mental illness as a result of COVID is very, very low. We still, it's too early for us to uh, talk about the long-term sequelae of COVID on the brain. So far, we haven't had any, um, there haven't been enough evidence to suggest that uh, the COVID uh, has an impact on the brain and on your mental illness, on, on your mental health. So, so far we can uh, say that uh, in the acute stage, Apart from it causing a delirium, it does not have uh, any mental health implications if you de develop COVID. Uh, also, some papers have reported that to protect yourself or protective factors with regards to um, depression and anxiety are perceived social support and physical activity. So people who uh, uh, had good social support and people who were physically active in these um, subpopulations, the, the chances of depression and anxiety were actually quite low. Okay, so I will basically um, talk a bit about depression and anxiety since these are the two most prevalent dis mental health disorders um, we are seeing today. Uh, this could, this could be one of the most important take home messages today. Uh, depression is a real illness. Uh, it's, it's not something where some people say you can snap out of or something uh, which uh, if you, you know, do something positive, you can come out of. Depression is as a result of biochemical uh, changes in the brain. There are psychological factors and social factors, yes, but there is definitely uh, a change in brain chemistry in patients with depression. So it is actually a real illness and therefore uh, urgent intervention uh, has to be uh, sought for depression. It has a biopsychosocial theory in the sense the etiology is biological, a combination of genetics, um, brain chemistry, psychological factors and social factors. All these come together in the development of depression. Unfortunately, uh, women are affected more. Uh, even in the pandemic, we are seeing um, a higher prevalence rates, uh, higher prevalence rates of depression amongst women. Overall, even during non-COVID times, women are affected more by depression. The ratio is about two to one. Um, and we also we have also recognized subcategories of depression amongst women, such as postnatal depression, premenstrual, premenstrual dysphoria and perimenstrual uh, depressive disorder. So unfortunately, women are a vulnerable group to develop this disorder. Uh, the po on a positive note, it is a treatable mental health condition. It's, it, uh, you may be given a label of depression, but you can also remove that label. You can be treated effectively. And like I said initially, there is extremely good treatment. There is effective treatment available. And, uh, uh, and if you, get treatment and if you, um, if, if you adhere to treatment regimes, the chances of you recovering are very, very high. Um, another good take home message is untreated depression can kill. So uh, the commonest cause for suicide is depression, but it's not only suicide uh, which can kill by depression. Um, we also have a, a huge elderly population who have stopped taking their meds, who have stopped attending meds for, let's say, diabetes, hypertension, who have stopped taking care of themselves. And these can lead to um, dangerous sequelae like uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, etc. So these can also lead to uh, very bad physical consequences 
and um, uh, and untreated depression can lead to this and um, can cause uh, uh, other medical comorbidities as well. So seeking professional treatment for depression is important um, for the reasons I discussed. Um, untreated depression can be extremely debilitating. That is important to note. So we have a lot of patients who are at home who have been depressed for many years and um, uh, with, with a very low quality of life and they have not been able to engage in household activities, not been attending to work, their work performance has, de have de has deteriorated as a result of the untreated depression. So it can of course lead to suicide and other, other problems, but it can also have a huge impact on your quality of life, which is why it is so important that we take treatment and take um, treatment uh, early. Okay, so there are lots of options available in the treatment of depression and um, the, the options uh, will depend on the severity of your depression and the treatment options available in your hospital or in your country. In Sri Lanka, we have um, almost uh, all the medication that are used worldwide are available in Sri Lanka. So your psychiatrist will be able to find what the best fit for you, that will be able to find your best fit. Um, there is psychotherapy, so there are psychologists in Sri Lanka who will be able to um, uh, administer or offer you different psychotherapeutic options like such as CBT, interpersonal psychotherapy, um, family therapy, um, behavioral therapy, etc. Um, there are also lots of papers coming out there about the role of physical activity on the brain, on the mind. So engaging in um, physical activity three to four times a day, uh, aerobic exercises of about 30 minutes has been, have been, found, has been found to be beneficial uh, for depression, attending to a schedule, um, uh, adequate sleep, um, engaging in leisure activities, uh, keeping in touch with people, in, uh, interpersonal communication, all this have been found to be effective in the treatment of depression. Okay, um, when we talk about anxiety, it's a bit different to depression in the sense depression at all levels, mild, moderate and severe is actually very, very bad. That is, uh, th there is no good depression. Okay, so even mild depression has to be recognized and has to be treated. Mild depression may not require medication, but at least um, a, a form of informal psychotherapy will be beneficial. When it comes to anxiety, it's a bit different. So we all become anxious and anxiety is a necessary uh, human emotion and it is actually a protective human emotion. Um, and, if we are, and if we don't feel anxious, that means we are dead. So anxiety is, it's, it's normal to feel anxious. Um, research is coming out saying that a certain amount of anxiety is actually good for you. And it is probably what actually keeps us alive and uh, uh, away, from, away from harm. So this is um, uh, uh, a graph I use to teach my students. So the y-axis or the, um, the vertical axis shows your performance. It can be performance at anything. Let's we take ex an exam for an example. And the x-axis shows the degree of anxiety. So as you go towards the right-hand side, the anxiety increases. You can see that um, when anxiety slowly increases, your performance, is, performance actually improves. For example, if you're not um, worried about an exam or if you're not worried about the exam result, you're not going to research, you're not going to study. But if you start becoming worried about the exam or, an, or, or, um, or whatever task you have to do, then your anxiety will increase and that, and, and that will correlate with your level of performance. So actually a certain amount of anxiety is good for you. It's good for you to excel, to complete tasks, and will actually be a motivating factor. But once anxiety peaks to a certain level, then it actually becomes detrimental to a level where it actually reduces your performance. So uh, a certain amount of anxiety is beneficial, but 
um, anxiety beyond a certain point can be uh, detrimental and that can actually reduce your performance. Okay, so that is the anxiety we are talking about, the uh, a, a, a severe amount of anxiety for a long time. This is a famous um, uh, a, a depiction of how anxiety affects our body. So anxiety can affect all parts of our, of our body, all body systems, and it can actually have, so prolonged severe anxiety can actually have a huge impact on uh, most parts of your body. So taking treatment or managing an anxiety or severe anxiety is important. Again, there is effective treatment options available. There is good medication to reduce anxiety. There are lots of, um, I think Rashika will talk about this. There will be lot, there are lots of psychotherapeutic interventions that can be offered. Lots of psychotherapy, psychotherapy options that are available now, which you can um, engage in. And also if your anxiety is not too bad and it is, if you think it is still manageable, you're still able to do the things you used to do, you're, you're able to complete tasks um, that are allocated to you. You can even, you know, there are lots of good websites on the internet. There are self-help books, which can actually help you overcome or manage severe anxiety. Okay, so that's about it from me. Uh, in summary, uh, what we discussed was that mental health is not just the absence of mental illness. It is more than that. It is about being happy, about being content and having a fulfilling life and to be able to enjoy uh, good interpersonal relationships and to uh, perform at your optimal level. Mental illness is as a result of many things. It is not just one thing that brings about mental illness. It is a combination of positive and negative factors. And it is, uh, there are certain factors that are non-modifiable, like, the the, like we are born with the genes we have and we have to live with them. But there are certain things like staying away from substances, reducing alcohol intake, engaging in physical activity, maintaining good interpersonal relationships, all this and taking um, and uh, getting adequate um, uh, timely treatment for a mental illness, all this can bring about and promote good mental health. The pandemic has caused an extra burden on us, so burden on our mental health. So it has caused a lot of fear and a lot of a disruption in our social lives. So as a result of that, we are seeing an increase in depression and anxiety in our population and, and basically worldwide. But the good news is depression and anxiety are fortunately treatable mental illnesses. Um, it, is not a, it is not as a result of a weakness of our personality. And uh, there is effective treatment available. And all you need to do is ask for help. These are some uh, good websites you could visit in your free time. And they offer a lot of uh, good advice and um, some good information regarding identifying um, common mental illnesses and what to do about them. Okay, thanks, Nilusha. Thanks, Swashini. Thank you, that was really good. Um, now I'll hand it over to Rashika, but before I do that, I'll just do a brief introduction. Uh, Rashika has a Bachelor of Arts from Carlton College USA and her master and is her master of clinical psychology and PhD from the University of Melbourne. Rashika's PhD examined effective responsivity in Williams syndrome, a rare genetic disorder. Her thesis explored links between behavior, psychopsychology and the brain. She has also been involved with research and publication with her articles appearing in several peer reviewed journals. Rashika has been working in private practice for over 11 years now and is the founder owner of Open Mind Psych, a Melbourne based private psychology practice. She has previously worked at the University of Melbourne, the Royal Children's Hospital, the Monash Medical Center and Foundation House. Over to you now, Rashika. Thanks, Niru, for that introduction. And thanks to Harshini for um, setting the stage um, so that we have a greater understanding of what's happening at the moment with COVID and mental health. Um, so I'd like to thank the OGA for this opportunity as well to share some of my thoughts and tips about resilience and well-being in the midst of what we are going through at the moment. 
Um, so as uh, Niru mentioned, I do live in Melbourne, Australia, and we've been in lockdown for a better part of a whole year last year. Um, so we have had a rough 2020. And what I noticed in my private practice is that um, the escalation of people um, seeking help um, is just phenomenal. And this goes hand in hand with what Suhashini was mentioning, that there has been a rise in anxiety and depression overall due to COVID. The other thing I've noticed, though, is that the types of people seeking mental health has also changed. Um, you know, in our culture in particular, mental health um, and mental illness is stigmatized. But what I saw in my patients was kids from primary school to the elderly were showing up to receive um, treatment. And uh, upside, if at all, of COVID is that the stigma around mental health has actually started to reduce. And people are realizing that it's actually not a weakness to seek help. So today I'm going to start with a brief overview of, of how COVID has contributed to stress and what we can do to be more resilient and improve our well-being in the midst of mounting pressure. Uh, next slide, please. So difficulties break some men, but make others. So to a large extent, whether we break or make it is in our hands. Uh, the next slide. Thank you. So we are all very familiar with this concept of stress. We experience it at school, at home, on the road, in peak car traffic, when we watch cricket, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And as Suhashini said, some levels of stress are actually healthy and productive and can uh, produce good outcomes. Sri Lanka as a nation has gone through so much stress and trauma, riots, war, the tsunami, Easter day bombings, political turmoil. Uh, these are all events that have affected us at a national and at a personal level. And now along has come COVID. Uh, so what started off as stats and numbers of other people falling sick in other countries is now on our very doorstep. So people we know and love are falling ill and falling prey to this illness. And that's causing fear, stress, sadness, grief, and a whole lot of emotions that are sometimes novel to our experience because we've not gone through something like this pandemic before. Um, and it's not only affecting emotion in, in that sense, but it's affecting almost every domain of our lives, our livelihoods, our finances, you're trying desperately to vaccinate yourself, but you're, you're you know, coming across lots of barriers to doing so. Your kids are screaming while you're doing Zoom sessions and having meetings. You're cooking curries, cleaning rooms, and trying to focus on your work. It's, it's chaotic. And everyone and everything is getting on your nerves. So at this point, without even realizing, you are actually in the midst of quite a massive storm. Um, the next slide, please. So what is this thing called the elastic limit? So if our lifestyles and environment create pressure, which our bodies and minds can't cope with, we reach what we call this elastic limit. So just as an elastic band snaps, when you stretch it too far, we too can reach a breaking point if we are pushed beyond our limit. So then the challenge is, how can we bounce back and cope with a stressful situation and maintain a sense of wellness regardless of what's happening around us. So I'm going to be talking about this thing called resilience, which is a huge factor in what keeps us from snapping when we are surrounded by pressure. The next slide. What influences resilience? So I'm looking at three main uh, domains here. The first is individual factors, health and well-being. Uh, Suhashini mentioned some of these too. So things like personality, your genetics, ethnicity, financial situation, having a strong sense of self or purpose uh, and being able to regulate emotion and of course, physical health and well-being. In terms of life history and experience, past events and relationships can have some influence in terms of how we cope with stress in the present. And that this can include family history, your own history of mental illness or physical illness, previous trauma. Social and community support. So this is the support that we get from family and friends, the community, our workplaces and our school. 
um, feeling connected to others and drawing a sense of safety from these networks can actually buffer us during times of stress. So if you take this discussion, for example, uh, this is the ladies college community drawing together to support each other through this crisis. And you can see that this is something that can foster a sense of, uh, I'm not alone in this, and this can contribute towards your resilience. Next slide, please. So just as much as some things contribute to better resilience, other things contribute to the breaking of resilience. So if you look at toxic environments, unsupportive households or work or workplaces um, can, can reduce your sense of resilience. Now, unfortunately in Australia last year, we saw a massive rise in domestic violence because people were suddenly spending a lot of time together. And unfortunately, a lot of women were stuck with their abusers. Um, it could be that dynamics have changed because people are suddenly thrust into a situation that they're not used to. Um, and this can cause escalating conflict and create a toxic environment. Disconnection. Unfortunately, lack of connected, connectedness to others and increased isolation is part of lockdown and uh, um, this pandemic. And to make things worse with your masks on, you can't even read people's expressions anymore. Um, so this can lead to a sense of disconnect and feeling increasingly isolated as um, the, co the pandemic continues. Um, and the third factor is neglect. We are often, particularly as women, so consumed with looking after everyone else and everything else that we tend to not care for ourselves and we feel guilty when we stop to look after ourselves. And that is something that does not help with our sense of resilience. The next slide, please. So the good news is the human spirit is as tough as it comes. And so we can do something um, in despite massive amounts of stress, we can actually do something to deal with it. So what are these things? Let's move on to the next slide. So I'm going to be looking at four main aspects that we can use to foster a greater sense of well-being and resilience. These are the cognitive, social, emotional, and physical aspects. Moving on to the next slide. Cognitive. So this is to do with how we think. Um, so set realistic expectations for yourself and your families. Um, as you juggle many roles, be realistic in terms of what can actually be achieved and what is actually important. So for example, expecting a five-year-old to sit in front of the computer for several hours of the day is simply not going to happen. Um, understand what's important at this time. Is it to make sure your child's getting straight A's or is it to make sure that they go through this period feeling nurtured and safe? What are your priorities? Is it to have a spotless house or spend quality time with your family? This is the time to take stock and assess what your priorities are. And they might not be the same as someone else's and that's okay. So forget peer pressure, forget living up to all these wonderful stories that appear on Instagram and Facebook and do what feels right for you and your family. Um, the second thing is planning, set, uh, sorry, the third aspect is planning, setting goals and problem solving. So life can feel very out of control at this time. So control what you can. Setting some goals and problem solving what you can, can give you a sense of security and certainty when so much feels so uncontrollable. Having a sense of purpose, whether this purpose is getting through the next hour, providing a home for your uh, safe home for your family, or helping those in the community, it's important to have that sense of purpose. And it's actually been really wonderful to see what some of our LCIs have been doing over the last few months to help dogs, to help let the less fortunate collecting uh, food parcels. It's really been amazing to see how people have found a sense of purpose during this pandemic. Um, uh, in terms of perspective, it can feel like everything is going wrong and everything is really bleak. And undoubtedly, things are bleak and a lot of things are going wrong. But we need to be careful and mindful in terms of how we see our world. While there is a lot going wrong with this world, it is also important to acknowledge that some good and a lot of good actually remains. 
and we need to still make room for joy. For example, developing a perspective of being grateful is something that can promote, promote greater well-being. So last year, I gave myself a 100-day attitude of gratitude challenge. And I found that the more I looked for things to be grateful for, it helped me put COVID in perspective and not let it consume my entire headspace. And this certainly helped to buffer that sense of hopelessness that was starting to creep in. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, the, the second factor I'd like to look at is social factors. So as much as we might not be able to physically see each other, there are still ways in which we can connect. So while it's simple to like someone's post or scroll through Facebook feeds, try to be a little bit more intentional about reaching out and connecting with your network. Pick up the phone and actually call someone, send a message, organize a Zoom party, uh, and in particular, reach out to people who might be finding this period a little bit harder or who might be vulnerable at this time. As difficult as COVID is, this is also a golden opportunity when it comes to nurturing your relationships with your family. So just as much as a plant dies when we don't water it, relationships also suffer if we don't attend to it. Reconnect with your partner, play and make merry memories with your kids. If difficulties are arising in your family because your son is spending a lot more time with them, use it as an opportunity to address deeper issues in those relationships. The other thing to keep in mind is that relationships and traditional roles might need to adapt a little to the changing times. Um, and with added pressure, all family members need to adjust and work as a team and not just the, the mother figure or taking on all the responsibility um, for the family. Communication is important. Talk to each other and in particular talk to your children about what they are going through. Uh, we have a tendency to protect our kids um, and cotton wool them um, and shield them from what's happening, but that isn't actually going to help nurture their sense of security and resilience. We, myself included, lived in an era where soldiering on and getting on with it was the way we dealt with traumas and um, sort of negative events in our life. But this often meant that we were left to walk around with a lot of unresolved trauma and symptoms. Don't let your children have to go through a similar fate. The third uh, factor is the emotional side of things. So what is emotional intelligence? So simply put, it is the ability to understand your own emotions and those of those around you. At this time, you will probably experience quite a range of emotions. You'll be relieved that you can roll out of bed and go to work in two minutes. You might be anxious, depressed. You'll have a lot of grief because at every level, we are su suffering loss. Uh, loss of the way of life, loss of people, loss of income, loss of safety, and, and with loss comes grief. Um, know how to recognize these symptoms because this actually helps you be understanding towards yourself and other people. To give you a little bit of an example, when, when one is depressed, it also comes along with certain symptoms such as low motivation and loss of interest. So on the surface, this could be this could look like someone's being really lazy. But if you were actually a bit more aware of emotion and mental health, you might realize that these are actually symptoms of depression and you'll, and, uh, you'll sort of respond to them in a more understanding way. So take note of how these emotions are showing up in your body and mind, as Suhashini also pointed out, and attend to them if need be. It's really important to have a bit of a toolkit of strategies in terms of how you manage your emotion. So for some people, this might be having a good cry in the shower, jumping on a treadmill, baking, drawing, calling a friend, binging on Netflix, screaming into a pillow. It could be any of those. Identify and use the tools that work best for you and help your children and family do the same. Spirituality and religion is often a means through which people find comfort and perspective. Humor, uh, going back a slide, please. Yeah, 
So Huma, you might have noticed there's a sudden uh, sort of surge of um, memes related to coronavirus on Facebook. And this has provided much needed comic relief. So humor and laughter is actually a really healthy way of building resilience. Now we are the generation that's plugged in. You get a message and within half a second you have responded to it. Thanks to technology and media, we know exactly what's happening all over the world. But this is a bit of a double-edged sword because while we can stay informed, it also increases your stress levels. So be careful of your news diet. Uh, it can feel like you have to be immersed in this whole COVID situation, but it can become too much. So detach yourself from time to time, and that gives you a bit of a healthy separation from that stress. Seeking help. Um, there is no shame in seeking help from friends or professionals. If you feel like you're affected, and if you do nothing about it, it doesn't only impact you, it actually impacts the people around you as well. If you feel like your mental health has taken a turn for the worse, turn to counselors and psychologists who can help you navigate those. If you are in a domestic abuse situation, and especially if you are in danger, reach out to someone you trust and remove yourself from that situation if you can. You have nothing to be ashamed of. And the next slide. So these are some practical steps and you know it might sound really obvious but the reality is we tend to ignore the obvious so i'm just going to briefly go through a few practical steps that we can implement on a day-to-day -day basis that helps our sense of resilience and well-being so routine it's really tempting to stay in your pjs all day and roll out of beds a minute before a meeting but not having a sense of routine can actually exacerbate stress Try to have some structure in your day, making time for meals, breaks, and time with your family. But this also means that it's important to have clear boundaries, especially if you're working from home. Try, if, if you have the means, to have a separate workspace and also set some time limits around work so that you're not working and meshing that into your home time as well. Plan some breaks. Just as much as a computer gets sluggish, if you keep it on all day, we are the same. So reboot and refresh, even if it's a two minute break, it can make a difference. Now, when we are under stress, we release stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. And these hormones can negatively impact sleep, mood, and keep stress elevated. So one of the most efficient ways of pumping these hormones out is actually exercise. And as Suhashini mentioned, exercise has turned up as one of the most effective strategies for depression and anxiety. So you might need to be a little bit more creative with how you exercise if walks are prohibited. I'm not sure what the situation is there. Uh, but you know, if you can't go for a walk, try something like jumping around with the kids or YouTube um, exercise videos or you, you know, yoga Zoom sessions with your friends, but make sure that you actually prioritize that at this time. What's happened to your eating patterns? So with a lot of my patients have either gone eating too much or losing their appetite and stress can actually impact us either way. So watch why you eat. So if you're starting to eat a little bit more and you're having more trips to the kitchen, have a look at, are you stressed? Are you bored? Are you restless? Are you upset? Or are you actually hungry? And if the core reason that you're eating is something other than hunger, see in what other ways you can address it. So again, this is an, an opportunity to nurture your body by eating healthy, delicious food and make time for it. Don't sit at your workspace and gobble up your food. Actually enjoy that time you have to nourish your body. Sleep hygiene is something that can get quite disrupted when there's lack of structure. So sleeping late, waking up late um, can disrupt your sleep rhythms and this in turn can have a negative impact on your mental health. So what has happened to all those hours that you have saved now that you're not sitting in peak hour traffic? Has it gone to more work and more housework or are you doing something with it? This is your chance to reconnect with lost hobbies and simple pleasures. Everything in life needs balance. 
So find some ways in which you can relax and bring a bit of pleasure and release that pressure that you're feeling. So whether it's hobbies or meditation or long showers or growing tomatoes, whatever it is, find whatever it is that brings you pleasure and relaxation. The next slide, please. We love doing things and fixing things, right? And sometimes we just need to be still. We need to listen to our inner voice, to observe our thoughts, sit with our emotions, and not feel like we have to act or do or move. In this hectic world, we have lost this art of stillness, and there's so much to be gained from being still. So for just one minute, I'd like you to do a little bit of breathing. So take a nice deep in breath, um, for, uh, nice and slow, hold it for a minute, second, and, and breathe out. And in that time, the only focus needs to be what the breath in and the breath out and try and block out the rest of the world. Just do about five rounds and then I will continue. So reflect a bit on how that made you feel. When we are more anxious and when we are more stressed, we actually tend to hold our breath or breathe fast. And that sends a message to the brain that something is very wrong. When we stop to breathe slowly, like we are on a beach somewhere, it actually calms down that panic system in the brain and says, you know, I can't be in a panic situation if I'm breathing so calm. Maybe it's not so bad. Take time to be still and breathe um, as we go through these tough times. The next slide, please. So I've put some questions here for you to consider for yourself. Um, mental health is often stigmatized in our culture. We don't like to see ourselves as mentally affected but we are human and we are impacted by the world around us. This does not make us lesser or weaker. And I hope that this discussion encourages you to take more note of your mental well-being and take action to address it. The next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite slides from this book. Um, the storm might be ugly and the storm may last a very long time but the storm does get tired. Strengthen yourself, arm yourself with the tools to look after yourself and your family. And remember, just hold on. Thank you. Thank you, Rashka, for that. It was really, really interesting. Um, I think we're going to open up now for some questions. Like I mentioned at the start, you, if you don't want uh, the rest of the audience to see your questions. You can send the questions directly to the panelists. You can type it into the chat box. So I think we have, yeah, we, should, we have about 15 minutes where either of the panelists can take questions. Swashni, do you see any questions coming in? I think you're on mute, Swashni. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, thank you. Okay, so there's a question from um, Carvin uh, asking, what is adequate sleep? Does it depend on the person? Um, okay, so that's a good question. Um, good sleep is defined by an adequate duration as well as uh, sleep quality. So a uh, general uh, adult human requires about six to eight hours of sleep to function um, adequately. 
um, but it, there, is, there, there can be some outliers where some people are completely fine after sleeping for about four to five hours. And there can be people in the other end where they require about um, uh, eight to 10 hours of sleep. Uh, generally, what we say is six to seven hours of sleep is adequate. Uh, sleep quality is determined not only by the duration of sleep, but also um, the, the other factors going to sleep quality, such as um, rec recurrent awakenings during the night, early morning awakening, um, other issues such as snoring problems, uh, recurrent nightmares. So when we talk about adequate sleep, we talk about all this, uh, the duration of sleep, as well as we call these uh, parasomnias where you can have um, other pathologies uh, during your sleep cycle. There's a question about being still. Um, so you might have come across this concept of mindfulness. It's this sense of being present in the moment. Um, I describe it to my patients as when they are sitting with me, I have their folder with me. I don't open everyone else's folder. My focus is in that moment with that person. So it's that same concept applied to life. If you're, for example, playing with your child, and you're thinking about dinner, you're thinking about uh, the next meeting you have, you're thinking about your to-do list tomorrow, then your mind is in different folders and not in the present. So that sense of mindfulness is about being present, using all your senses. What can I see, feel, smell, hear, touch um, to engage in the present? And that can bring a sense of stillness rather than this sense of chaos and multitasking, which we think is fantastic, but actually may not be so great for that sense of just being present in the moment. Uh, so I would say look up things like meditation, look up things like mindfulness. And the main thing is don't feel guilty for being still. We, we are a, you know, a society that doesn't place value on doing nothing, but it's actually a really good skill to cultivate. I hope that answers okay, the question. A, there's a very interesting question. Um, at which point does one know that he saw her mental health has deteriorated to the point that they need external help as opposed to self-help? Okay, so that's, that's a, a very good question actually. Um, um, I would say that if your functioning has been affected, if you feel that you're not able to do the things you usually used to do. Um, if you used to go to work and you functioned well there, um, if you did a household chores and you're no longer able to do them. Um, and also if you have tried various self-help methods um, and if all this is failing, then it is probably time that you actually get professional help. Um, if your interpersonal relationships are deteriorating, if you're getting irritable with people, if there are breakdowns, uh, if there is a breakdown in relationships, um, if, um, if there are complaints from school, from the workplace, and if you always find yourself as if um, you're, you're, you're not able to perform at your optimal level, then that is probably a good indication that the self-help methods you've tried are not working and uh, it is time to probably get professional help. Um, like what Rashika said, so there is a lot of stigma in going and meeting mental health professionals. Um, mental health is like any other disorder. It is a disorder of the brain. So just like your heart can get affected, your kidneys can fall ill, so can your brain. Um, and that is not um, immune to uh, insults. So seeking professional help can actually alleviate a lot of suffering. And um, the problem with mental health, unlike other disorders, is that it affects other people around you. It affects your loved ones. If you're not mentally sound and if you're suffering, this can affect your kids, your spouses, your parents, and it can have a detrimental effect on them as well. So that is why it's very important 
that you seek professional help early. Um, yeah, professional help early. Um, there's another question here about young people who are academically very bright, but struggle with emotional resilience. Um, I think, you know, with, with academic brightness, often the priority is study, and sometimes there isn't that sense of balance. Um, doing other activities or exercise or even emotional intelligence in terms of talking about emotion, um, to understanding emotion. And it, particularly in, in this COVID situation, a lot of pressure has built up. So I've had a lot of students coming to me who have lost motivation, lost interest in studies. And this has caused even more pressure because they can't perform the way they want to perform. So I think this is possibly a reason why academically bright students might still struggle in, in these times. And so it's really important to build those other aspects for them so that it's not just about studying, but it's about knowing how to deal with life and um, challenges in life as well. Um, so I should be, there seems to be one other question uh, which says, is not being able to sit still also an indicative of, a, of an issue? Is it also indicative of an issue? Um, uh, it, uh, there, is a, there is a disorder called restless leg syndrome. Um, it is, it's a neurological disorder and it's also seen transiently um, in pregnancy and in certain other uh, viral disorders as well. Um, and it's, it's also seen um, as a side effect of certain medication, uh, certain medication that psychiatrists use um, and also um, as, uh, and in certain chemotherapeutic agents. So uh, you, you need to take a, a more detailed history um, and um, Rashka might tell you it can also be um, a symptom of uh, ADHD or hyperactive disorder where kids find it very difficult to stay in one place and stay still. So um, depending on the age, uh, what medication the person is on and the person's uh, medical history, uh, we'll be able to narrow it down to what the cause is and what, uh, whether, it's a, a whether there is an actual diagnosis behind it. Um, and it also depends on whether you're talking about physical stillness or mentally attention um, and with attention as well if if you're not able to focus it could be indicative of depression or anxiety or adhd um, or it could be a lack of practice that we are not used to focusing and and just being because we have these other expectations that we place on ourselves that we need to do in order to be successful or that's just the way we are. So it really depends on what kind of stillness you're referring to here. I've got a direct question here as well. Um, it says, what can we do if we experience deterioration in our effectiveness at work? So as I said before, you know, we could sometimes, um, if we are having some reactions to COVID, it could be that we lose motivation, we are more tired, uh, we can't concentrate as much, uh, we can't focus, and these could be symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, so it's important to be aware of what those symptoms are and seek help if you are noticing such changes. Um, so in terms of what can we do to um, sort of address the situation, one is obviously attend to the symptoms, but also work in smaller blocks. Um, have frequent breaks. There's a, a simple formula, which is for every hour of work, take a five minute break. For every two hours of work, take a 30 minute break. Walk around. It can, it can be very tempting to sit on your chair from morning till night, but walk around, change the environment in which you work. Just go and sit in your backyard or, um, you know, change the room in which you work if you feel like you're stagnating where you are. So there's a few, few different things um, that you can do to actually shift that deterioration in your effectiveness? Um, there are a few direct uh, questions. So um, is, there a, is there any contact number to speak in the event uh, one ex if one experiences depression? Um, there are some uh, mental health hotlines uh, in Sri Lanka like um, the Sumitreo, 
um, then the uh, National Institute of Mental Health. I think the, there's a direct number nine. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll have to check that check that up on the internet. It goes as the National Institute of Mental Health. So those are the um, uh, direct numbers you could um, speak to in the event of depression, uh, or if you feel that you're depressed. Uh, there's another question, how can we help kids who are finding online learning a challenge? Okay, so that's a universal uh, <laughs> problem these days. Um, if we, I mean, what, what a child psychiatrist will tell you, is that a child's attention span is um, is 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 is, uh, is is very small? So um, especially when it's online learning, that demands a child to sit in front um, of an artificial school environment and uh, connect with the teacher uh, without connecting with his peers and uh, uh, um, uh, devote his entire attention to this screen. So number one, uh, uh, online learning is, uh, if, if your kid is finding it a challenge, it is, I mean, you're in the majority. Um, the best way around it is A, to give the kid a lot of breaks in the sense, if, if, if possible, 15 to 20 minute break, um, breaks. Um, another uh, thing a child psychiatrist will tell you is positive reinforcements work very well with children. So you could tell them beforehand. Um, if you get through this class, or if you uh, if you if you are if you manage to spend time, if you if you are able to concentrate for twenty minutes, then at the end of the at the end of that task, mommy will give you etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And make sure that whatever you offer this child are, are, are doable, and that there should be immediate rewards. They, 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 things won't work like if you if you concentrate for twenty minutes, I'll take you to the beach on Saturday. That's not going to work. It has to be immediate rewards. Like if you, if you do this, you will get um, chocolate, uh, a chocolate, or you will get uh, uh, ten minutes of screen time, something like that. So, um, so positive reinforcements and um, uh, short short spells of online learning. So far, uh, child psychiatrists have found them to be useful. Uh, there's another question. How can mental health be affected by thyroid under physical health? Okay, so thyroid disease is um, a very common disorder that can cause mental health disorders. Uh, hypothyroidism, that is an underactive thyroid gland, is, um, uh, is, is a major contributory factor to depression. In fact, if I find my patients not responding uh, to treatment, that is one of the tests I would do, a T4 and a, T a thyroid profile. And uh, in, the, in the majority of them, I would find thyroid disease. Anxiety disorders are very common in hyperthyroidism, that is an overactive thyroid gland. And um, this is one of the, this is why it's so important that um, uh, a professional looks into this. Um, because this, these are easily easily correctable, so you don't actually require a psychiatric medication. If you can correct the thyroid dysfunction by antithyroid drugs or thyroid replacement, then um, this is an immediate cure for the depression um, and anxiety. And I would add to that um, vitamin D as well. We are we are staying indoors a whole lot. Um, and um, low vitamin D levels can also masquerade as some symptoms of depression. So those are a couple of, it's, uh, that's a good point, Suhash, you need to also look at physical factors or biological factors that might be um, causing some of those symptoms that it, they're not necessarily mental health issues, it's a physical issue as well. So it's good to screen for those things. Um, there's a direct question. What can we do to help the older senior citizens who are stuck at home and, and lacking that social interaction? As you notice a drop in mental stimulation and interest. It is actually quite a big problem. I mean, in, when we talk about dementia, one of the main factors or one of the main protective factors we talk about is social interaction. And um, there's lots of research to say, to show that the rate of progression of dementia actually reduces um, if you if there is a lot of human interaction. I think in um, in, in in Australia and in some parts of um, US, they have actually combined elders' homes with nurseries, where they have shown that interacting with children can retard the progression of dementia. 
So this is uh, a sad state of affairs and majority of um, elderly people in Sri Lanka don't have access to uh, Wi-Fi and uh, technology. So um, I guess one good thing we do see in, in our culture and in, in Sri Lanka is that a lot of um, elderly people still do live with their children and there are there are other people present at home and um, there are grandchildren present at home. So, uh, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a good thing we see in Sri Lanka. Um, I don't know, Rashika, do you, do you have any suggestions how to help elderly isolation? Well, look, as you know, we are restricted by sort of the rules in place. So as sad as it is, we can't actually physically be there meeting them. And the closest thing we can do is maybe pick up the phone because they might not know how to navigate Zoom and Skype and all that. Pick up the actual phone and talk to them. Even if it's just a three, you know, I, I have a lot of elderly patients and they look forward to that little bit of contact they have. Um, I've had patients who do drive-bys. So they drive by their grandma's or grandpa's house and do a wave. And just that sense of connection, it, even though it's such a tiny gesture, it, it's their highlight of the day. So those are little things that can still be done um, given the limitations that we have. But it is, it is quite a significant issue that a lot of elderly are heavily impacted by this. There's another direct question or uh, Rashka, do you want to, do you have any? What is this? Oh, no, I have no more, yeah. Okay. So if the children are not all, not at all getting along with the online schooling, how can I handle them? The behavior has changed in children. Uh, I agree. Again, um, it's, it's, it's very artificial. I mean, homeschooling is very artificial and it's, I mean, it's, um, earlier at the very outset of the pandemic, um, the, the, uh, some um, schools actually did not recommend um, online teaching, but since this now the, the pandemic is dragging on, schools have no option. Um, I, I had a patient yesterday who came and told me that she will she only concentrates on maths and English, and she uh, she doesn't care whether the uh, child uh, doesn't listen to the other subjects. So I guess that is in a way what Rashika was saying. It's it's a way of prioritizing. So maybe it, it might be difficult for your child to sit through the whole day. Uh, I mean, her child was uh, in year six and classes were from nine to two o'clock in the afternoon with small breaks in between. And I thought that was, I mean, it's quite a task to get a child to sit uh, in front of a computer for about five hours. So she, uh, so again, so she had prioritized saying that for the maths and the English classes, she got them to uh, sit, but I mean, she didn't um, fuss too much if they didn't concentrate um, uh, with um, the other in, in the other subjects. Um, also, probably uh, if you're spending time a lot of time at home and you're working from home, maybe uh, you you could probably follow the class and then um, get I mean understand what the teacher was teaching and then maybe you could teach the child. So I mean that that is another. Uh, another um, a method some parents do where they, they learn what the teacher says, they try to absorb that. And uh, instead of putting the child in front of the computer, they teach the child. So I guess we'll have to be flexible also. But um, like you said, we are seeing a lot of internet addiction. Um, there are lots of adolescents who present to me with uh, gaming addiction um, as a result of uh, increased screen time during the pandemic. So, the other thing is, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. um, the other thing is to touch base with the school and I have a sense of what they're actually expecting as well. So my little one was just in prep. So this, the year before year one, and she was over Zoom very quickly. And when I checked in with the teachers, they actually said, look, we just want them to have a, a rough idea of this. If they spend two hours a day on this, that should be more than enough. So actually, you might have this sense of, oh, you know, we've sent, we've been sent all this work and it's expected that we do all of this, but check in with the teachers to see whether that's actually what's expected also and explain to them, this is what's happening um, and what do I do? Go, go to the root of the problem. And also have a, uh, uh, have variety during the days. I mean, that really works for children. Um, and again, like we spoke about 
earlier Rashika was stressing on it about the importance of a structure, structuring your day and structuring the day for the child. So a, a variety, so try and throw in some fun activities if possible. And um, uh, probably it probably doesn't matter if you don't, you know, do the revision class every, every day, but instead of that, you can, you know, uh, uh, throw in something more interesting for the kid. But uh, day structuring is actually very, very important. Make sure that your child gets up at, I don't know, seven o'clock in the morning, has lunch at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, et cetera, et cetera. So we have seen a lot of loss of uh, day structuring happening and that leading to lots of problems in adolescents and children. Um, there's another question. How would you advise a person who is suffering from insomnia, which has increased in the past few months? Okay, so uh, insomnia, there are lots of etiologies for insomnia. So if you sit down with a medical, with a, with a doctor, they will first find out what, what the cause of insomnia is. There are lots of causes. There can be uh, illnesses, like somebody brought up thyroid disease. So hypo and hyperthyroidism both can cause insomnia. Then there are psychological factors. If you, people can't sleep before exams, and there are other factors, environmental factors, like um, an improper sleeping environment. Um, uh, these days are very hot in Sri Lanka. So if your room is uncomfortable, so first we'll have to find out what the cause for the insomnia is. And then um, there are non-pharmacological or non-therapeutic ways and therapeutic ways of managing insomnia. So what Prashika mentioned about sleep hygiene, that is probably the first things that will be introduced to you. Where um, There are lots of good websites where you can go and read about sleep hygiene. That is about sticking to a routine, uh, going to sleep the same uh, around the same time each night, um, staying away from caffeine and um, um, stimulant drinks, avoiding exercise one hour before bedtime, making sure that your um, bedroom is comfortable, uh, the temperature is, is good, is comfortable, dim your lights, um, make sure there is not, I mean, if you can control the noise level, try and control that. Avoid screen time, avoid devices before about one hour before bedtime. Um, uh, uh, and um, then uh, th there are ways where if you still can't uh, fall asleep, then there are ad ad other um, methods uh, that can be introduced as well. Uh, medication has also been shown to be effective. That depends on how bad your insomnia is and how whether sleep hygiene techniques have been um, not successful. Uh, there are good medication out there from melatonin um, or other sleep hormone uh, de derivatives to benzodiazepines to other medication as well. So it depends on um, uh, what the cause is and addressing the cause and, um, and then taking it from there. There's uh, a direct question here, sorry. Um, do you think parents and teachers need to meet on Zoom to hear from the other the struggles faced with online classes? That's a really good idea because it could be that you actually share a problem that many people in your child's class have and the teachers might not know about it unless there's some sort of feedback. So that's a very good thing to propose to the teachers to have a session for the parents so that you can you know, troubleshoot the issue together. Unfortunately, I think we have time only for one more question. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any direct questions? Because um, are there any support groups, communities for us to join relating to mental health? Um, it depends on what what you would like to. I mean, if it is if you want to get help, then yes, the Sumit <laughs> there are. Um, uh, uh, I think it depends. So if the, if it's in a, there is a Sri Lanka Alzheimer's Foundation, there are depending on um, what what you're interested in and what you are what you what you would like to volunteer for there are lots of support groups and also there are you can help hospitals directly by offering um, your time um, and services so i suggest that um, you go online and um, you could just type in uh, mental health groups in sri lanka and uh, that might give you some information Thank you, Swashni. Um, were there, is there anything more? Um, no, that's that's about it, Nirusha. Yeah, that's about it. Perfect. So thank you, Swashni, and thank you, Rashika.
and thank you to everyone who actually participated today. We hope that you've uh, benefited from this. And thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.